Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Legalpreneurs Lab Geeky Guru in Residence series. If you've been attending this series already, you know um, that it's a great time to kind of hang out with the gurus. In this case, our guru is Carl White. Um, and Carl, of course, is um, the leading proponent of this whole area of client experience. And um, he's going to kind of take us to uh, back to basics and foundations in a way, which is a really good place to start if you're not familiar with this. And even if you are, it's a great refresher. So do get your, your questions ready because we'll have um, plenty of time to be able to do that. So Carl will do a bit of a prezzo first just to lay um, a few foundations for you. Um, throw the questions in as he's going along or, you know, I'll remind you about those again towards the end. Uh, to make sure that you do them. So just have a quick look uh, now at the bottom of your screen. For those of you that haven't come to these sessions before, you'll see there's a couple of Q&A little bubbles there, look like little discussion bubbles. If you can put your questions in there, that'll be great and we'll be sure to, um, to pick them up. But you're here today to listen to the wonderful Carl White. Um, and as I said, he is the guru in client experience. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Carl, and go away. I'll be here in the background and we'll come back for, um, for Q&A. But it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for spending the time with us and uh, with our lab members. We really appreciate it. And over to you. Thank you. I like the guru. I'll, I'll go with that. Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, I thought it would be kind of useful just to... Um, have at least three pointers on the board for uh, the discussion this afternoon. So, you know, essentially looking at um, kind of understanding why a focus on CX is, is a key is key to success for, for legal service providers today. Um, consider some of the building blocks for developing CX using a case study. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about Moores, which is a Moores practice firm based here in Melbourne. Um, and um, I guess, look, Taking a, actually a little bit of a st strategic view to developing client experience, um, but I hope to make that practical with some hints and tips that you'll find helpful along the way too. So it's quite a lot in here, and it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. I'm going to go at quite a clip, um, but again, hopefully there'll be some good things to digest as we as we move through. All right, I'm going to start in a relatively easy place um, with uh, your own service experience. Um, I suppose one of the good things about CX as a topic is that it is something we're all familiar with because we're all customers of different services, aren't we? And you, know, you may or may not recognize some of those services um, on the uh, PowerPoint at the moment. Um, but the, you know, the point I wanna make here um, is a really important and fundamental one. And it's, and, and, and it's a point that you know, regardless of how sophisticated um, your law firm is, your, your, your organization, regardless of how sophisticated your, your, your clients are, again, we, we, we're all customers. So we all understand, I think, what, what good service looks like and sounds like and how that feels. And, and also the opposite, we all understand what, what terrible service looks like and sounds like and how that feels and how we, and how we respond to that. Um, so it's kind of familiar territory in a way. And I would say that, you know, as of now, as we sit here now, we, we've, we've actually never been so attuned to our experience of service and the changing world of service um, as we are as we are today. So, you know, whether it be, you know, receiving that Amazon package, um, stepping into that um, Apple store and receiving that greeting, you know, at the um, at the door. Um, whether it's kind of almost instantaneously being able to watch that Netflix movie, whether it's cheering on our health service. But whether it's you know tracking our food delivery um, over over Uber Eats, you know all of this is ever present in our service world today, um, and it's changing all the time. And what I would say is that again, you know your clients um, are um, their expectations of service um, are being informed by that. We're no longer comparing apples with apples. <laughs> We're no longer comparing one law firm with another law firm um, as, as as a client. We might be even be comparing the law firm, our law firm, with our Apple experience, in fact. So the best of the service world. So this is a really important starting place. And it's often a good one, actually, to start um, with, you know, with your teams, 
You know, what do we expect from service? What are our service experiences? The point to make here as well, of course, is that CX, you know, by, by way of a definition, is any moment where an impression of service is perceived by its service users, any moment where that's perceived. Um, and that's interesting because there are lots of moments when experiencing um, law where, you know, we can obviously make our clients go ouch and not even realize that uh, we're perhaps doing that. And of course, there are moments where we, we may not just satisfy our clients with how we're doing our work, but even have the possibility to delight our clients as well. So, you know, this idea of client delight um, is one that I would really like you to, to kind of entertain and, and also to take seriously because it is achievable. Um, so, you know, let's, let's take that, that experience economy, if you like, and start to understand it more fully um, and its implications within, within law. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I'll be kind of dipping in and out of talking a little bit about Moore's more specifically, because this is a firm that CX and Law has been working with now since about 2015 on their client experience journey. And that timeline as well tells you something about, I think, the need to, you know, understand that developing an amazing or remarkable client experience is not a one hit wonder. It's, it's not necessarily a set and forget. It's not something that law firms love to do, which which is, you know, yes, we, we did that customer service training course 10 years ago. Uh, so we've done that tick. Um, it, 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 it's an ever evolving kind of point of focus. And Affirm is a good kind of example of that. So, um, you know, let's think about this because, you know, what are the implications of this service one, our experience of it on law? Well, you know, here's, here's Moore's um, uh, website homepage. Uh, Moore's is a value price firm. It's a preeminent firm very well regarded, already excellent. Um, and like many other firms, you know, it, it, it says some really good things about itself. It, it, itself. You know, we are a value driven law firm, we're here for good. Um, we're looking for like-minded organizations to work with and so on. So it's got a really nice, you know, it's making really nice statements and, and why not? <laughs> um, the key, the key here to all, all of this client experience conversation and its development is now, today, is we can't just say that stuff and not actually deliver it. So we really need to understand what does that mean? We are a values driven law firm. What does that actually mean? At every touch point with the client, how do we bring that to life? How do we bring that to life with our, with our client focused processes? You know, how do, how, what's our service delivery process like? How do we bring that to life with our skills and our capabilities as individual service providers? Now, how do we bring that to life with our overall mindset and our service culture? We need to know how to bring that to life. And it's always so fascinating working in this area because, you know, you can actually show a law firm the kind of stuff it presents to the outside world. So let's just say, you know, that was a couple of, uh, let's say it's a service promise from its website or a service statement from its own website and take away the branding. And very few firms in our experience will actually recognize they, they won't actually be able to spot that what that statement is, that, that that's a statement that, that they are presenting to the outside world. It's about their law firm. So they, they kind of go, um, is that what we say about ourselves? And it, it's always funny because, you know, how can, how can we expect to bring to life a remarkable level of service when we might not even be able to spot our own service statement? Let's call it a service promise. Um, and, and, and actually so spot that and actually understand what that looks like and what that sounds like. So again, another really important starting point. Now, what, what, what do we promise? Do we deliver what's on the tin? What does that look like and sound like? How do we bring that to life? What does a values-driven law firm mean at every, uh, every interaction point with, with, with our clients? Now, depending on how well we bring that to life, by the way, we are a values-driven law firm and what that actually means in practice. So our clients experience it. Then of course, our clients are gonna respond in at least one of three ways. <laughs> so, you know, here we have a detractor, a passive and promoter. You probably recognize those faces. Um, very angry looking Hugh Jackman, a kind of unimpressed looking, or at least not very enthusiastic looking uh, Simon Cowell. And hopefully you still recognize the fonts. Um, so he's our promoter. 
So, you know, depending on how well we bring that service promise to life for our clients, then our clients are going to respond in these various different ways. And that understanding is really important. Um, that conversation, so bringing this to the attention of your teams and your staff, that actually clients can be detractors, they can be indifferent, and they can actually become promoters. Um, and being able to talk about that in constructive ways, in practical ways, and in ways that can be measured um, is really important. So, you know, you may or may not be familiar with the Net Promoter Score or NPS, but, you know, that's a scale out of 10. You know, it's either a really bad service that turns us into those angry Hugh Jackmans, Wolverines, or, you know, all of the interactions we've had have added up and the sum total of that has turned us into a promoter, an advocate, a loyal client, someone who would want to retain us and would talk positively about us in the marketplace. The golden opportunity, it has to be said, for, for legal service providers often exists in the middle, that kind of sense of indifference. Um, um, you know, it, it, we're as likely to call another law firm perhaps as to go back to the one who, um, who, who's helped us in the past. Um, we, deli we, we, we would deliver a, um, a reasonable legal result, um, but we had some question marks about you know, the timeliness of that delivery and the communication through that delivery and so on. The kind of things that actually make clients feel less inclined to talk about you positively um, and, uh, and retain your service. So this can be measured out of 10. There is a service metric for that. Understanding that metric or which service measurement is right for your law firm um, is really important. Um, as important, is almost resetting the goal for your firm, for your organization. So if you are a legal service provider, um, I think it's probably safe to say you're already good at the law. You know, you can do the law. So that's great. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd get into trouble and we probably wouldn't, you know, um, uh, have, have a right to be on the playing field. Um, but, you know, very little complaints about law firms and legal service providers, as we know from the Legal Services Board, you know, come from badly delivered law. It comes from, you know, a badly delivered service. Right? So we differentiate on service, not necessarily on legal brilliance today. I think that's becoming recognized. Um, so the experience is a law firm's biggest differentiator. What that means is you need to make the client experience, turning, cli turning clients into promoters, you need to make that your goal, your organization's goal. And if you can do that effectively, then really good things begin to happen. That becomes a motivating goal, a point of focus for all, all, the, all employees working together to deliver upon that aspiration, turning clients into promoters. And of course, I do say that knowing that you know, law isn't a piece of cake. You know, law is often a grudge purchase. Um, you know, in litigation, it can be harder in one practice area than others and so on and so forth. But, you know, let's make our goal turning clients into promoters. Um, and if we do that, it can be incredibly motivating. So, what Moores did was it took this idea of service can be measured and used it as a provocation use the information they gained from how well are we doing this part of our service? So what they did is they looked at, first of all, the first part of the client journey. How well do we um, deal with a brand new inquiry or indeed an existing client who comes to us with a legal need? How well do we deal with that? Do we actually convert that work we want into great profitable fee paying work? You know? So it was a client engagement point they chose to look at first. They used some current data they had, how well are we doing here? They used some current operational data there, but they also decided to use some new insight tools. So what you're looking at here actually is the result of some mystery shopping. Still quite an unusual tool to use in law, not so much elsewhere in other service sectors. So why not? Why wouldn't we use a tool from the consumer service sector in law, because law is basically you know, just a service provider like every other service provider. So you know, mystery shopping is a tool, an insight tool that we, that we use, we deploy. So we use this mystery shopping tool 
to create a snapshot of what the client experience was like at the first point of contact. How well did malls convert, you know, work, um, potential work into, um, uh, into files, into, in, into secured work. So we um, ran a number of inquiries through the system. Um, and what we discovered was that 37% of that work, that potential work, um, the experience we received with the firm was not as good as it we would have liked as you know playing the part of, uh, of clients. So 37% actually led us to feel a bit more like detractors. So highly likely not to want to take the next step. 44% led us left us feeling indifferent, like as likely to maybe call a competitor to make contact with a competitor, and only 19%. Um, uh, the, the experience kind of inclined us to want to take that next that next step, which you know a, a, a paid a paid consultation, for instance. Yeah. So you know the the, the business case there um, began to form uh, because if you put money on the table, you know if you you, you turn all that into dollars, let's say there's seventy thousand dollars worth of work available to this law firm. Well, twenty five thousand dollars worth of that is is actually burnt because the client experience was just not good enough at those first touch points to convert from to convert the conversation into a, a, a proactive next step. $30,000 left on the table and only $13,000, i.e. kind of conversion from an inquiry into work, um, went forward. So only two in 10 felt inclined to instruct. Now that is really hard hitting information. In fact, Moore's described it as a wake up call. It was provocative insight and that's exactly what we want. We want to use insight from the client's perspective that is useful, that is actionable, that provokes, but that is dealt with um, with integrity and in a highly constructive fashion. So the idea here was to take insight and turn that into action, present that to staff, to all teams, to all roles and functions in a really constructive, um, energetic, <laughs> And often humorous, you know, some of this is kind of is serious, but it can be serious fun. You know, we're kind of holding that mirror up. We're, we're understanding, you know, how do we, what's the service reality? That's a kind of really important kind of point to consider. We say this about ourselves, what's the reality? And then engaging with that reality in, in a really proactive, constructive and action orientated way. And that's what Moore's did. So now, that information helped this firm to build its business case. Building the business case for client experience is really key. Um, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, it's obvious that client experience in a way is, should be a, everyone's point of focus. Um, and yet it can be one of the hardest things to actually, you know, engage with and invest in um, and stand behind for a law firm. So, you know, building the business case is really important. So, you know, they, they, they use data to validate the business case. They understood that they wanted to showcase the experience um, as, as a differentiator. They wanted to grow their market share. By focusing on those things and using client experience as almost like the lever, um, they were able to you know, uplift those conversions. They discovered they <laughs> basically generated you know, their most profitable year in five. And internally, they were able to kind of go on a real kind of staff engagement. Um, and so those numbers, those staff engagement numbers also increased. That's an important point because, you know, client experience, yes, of course, it's about clients. You know, the, the name is on the tin. But you cannot have a phenomenal client experience without also, um, you know, working on the employee experience. You know, actually in a way, arguably, it, it, it's the employees that matter, mo matter more than clients in one way. Um, because, you know, without them, without bringing them into the development process, you're never really going to um, elevate your client experience and then sustain it. So you need your team's help. This can never be just a marketing strategy or something that the boardroom just deals with and comes up with, you know, um, <clears throat> some service standards that it expects everyone else to abide by. 
it's got to be a whole certain focus. And this is something that you know Moore's understood and understands. Um, so you know, kind of bringing those things together and putting them into some into some boxes. Um, I quite like this kind of model. It's a, um, a CX client experience kind of maturity model. You know, Moore's understands that yes, it might be focusing on one part of the client journey, but its goal is is to continue to grow and thrive. Of course, that's every business's goal, isn't it? To th to grow and to thrive. Um, and, it, and it will achieve that by focusing on the client experience, so that's the external focus, but also by focusing inwardly, so that's the employee focus, and it's the focus on processes, it's the focus on, focus on efficiencies, doing what we do better, faster, and more conveniently internally, so it's also a focus on firm performance. It's those two things, both the vertical and the horizontal axis, working on both of those things together, builds the firm's capacity to thrive and to grow, not just to be productive, um, but kind of clients are, um, you know, not part of that mix, you know, we're super efficient for ourselves, but, you know, not so much for our clients. Um, you know, we might be really responsive to clients, but we not, actually might not have the processes and procedures and even the technology that enable that to happen for us as a business as well. Uh, and, and to operationalize that so so everything becomes easier so all of these things have got to kind of work in tandem quite like that and it might be a useful way to think about things you know the external and the internal focus and that movement toward being a thriving and growing firm those two things need to be developed and they can be developed at once it's a bit like a kind of a you know, I don't know exercising and you know as you exercise you're, you're working more than one muscle you know so um, here we have some, some pictures of Moore's in, in, in action. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about this. Um, you can see, I think the you know, picture speaks a thousand words here, doesn't it really? You, know, you, can, you can see this team or these teams at work and play here. They're having some fun. They're working on serious things. They're working on what are the moments where we might dissatisfied clients you know how do we eliminate eliminate those dissatisfiers but how do we also maybe identify those um, client delighters those opportunities to really stand out and impress that's what they're working on here in really practical ways and it's about bringing together all the different roles and functions so gone are the days where we can talk about lawyers and non-lawyers this is about being highly collaborative, about your director, about your receptionist being your director of first impressions, your legal assistants, your support staff, and your lawyers coming together because they're all games makers in the client experience. We, we're all a part of bringing that to life. We're all actors on that stage, putting that performance on. That's why everyone needs to be involved. And this, this is how it looks. <laughs> um, and in doing that, what we're actually doing is we're, we're, we're deepening and growing and making more remarkable your service culture. Because in the end, it is about culture. Culture trumps everything else. So it's very hard for a competitor, regardless of the industry, to replicate a remarkable service culture. That's very hard. It's easy to replicate a product and a service. It's actually easy to replicate law by having really brilliant lawyers. And you know, no one's saying there's, there's not enough good lawyers to choose from. There are plenty of good lawyers. But what's harder to pull off um, and replicate is an amazing service culture. So that's a really important part of this mix. That's where the magic happens, bringing people together to work together on achieving that goal, turning clients into promoters. And in doing that, we're going to make the world better for ourselves as well as operators, because everything's going to become faster, easier and better to do. Right? So what they're doing here is working on what could be described as a client journey. So there are, you know, arguably five parts to a client journey. Um, you can see them running across the top there. And then underneath that, there are a ton of touch points, as they're called. So moments where interactions happen with clients. Um, and look, here's just a few. And actually, you know, this slide in and of itself um, 
would be a slide to to take and work on just kind of right off the bat because there's a lot there's there's a lot of gold right right in the slide here. Um, but you know, if we look at this journey, there there are all these touch points that are opportunities to stand out. You know, do things faster, better, impress our clients, and all of those marginal gains, as they might be called, will add up. Um, and improve, you know, and, and, and elevate the, the, the client experience, the client's journey, creating that promoter. So again, the idea of marginal gains here, you know, plus ones. Walt Disney said, we must keep, we must keep on plussing our show. What a wonderful phrase. We must keep on plussing our show, plussing our show. So, you know, what are all those plus points um, that add up, add up and add up and add up? that create a remarkable service experience, not just a good legal result. What are all those minus ones, minus ones, minus ones, minus ones, minus ones that we might remove to make the world better for, our, for us as operators and uh, more positive for our, for our clients? So if you like, there's an on-stage version of this client journey, you know, what the client sees, experiences, and so on. And then there's a backstage part of this journey, uh, which is all the stuff that you know the law firm does to make stuff happen that's the backstage journey um, so it's that's kind of a useful way of looking at the on stage and the backstage and then they kind of meet in the middle and that's what the journey mapping is all about now it just so happened that moore's decided to and this is a good way of doing it zone in on one part of that journey to almost prove the business case and to make good progress with one, with one part of the journey right consideration and engagement Potential work into work, potential work into work, potential work into work. We'll focus on that and let's see what kind of a difference we can make. And they made a whole hell of a difference by just focusing on that. Yeah. So I wish there was more time to talk about journey mapping, um, but that will give you a sense of the kind of territory and the opportunities. You know, just to kind of bring that to life a little bit, um, if you've come to a presentation of mine before, you may, have, you may have seen this or come across it elsewhere. But, you know, this is a, a real life design <clears throat> thinking uh, exercise that took place within a, um, an American hospital, MRI scan. You know, this is the kind of experience you can imagine what this might feel like. It's particularly if you're a young child who's about to have this MRI scan, it might strike the fear of God into you, perhaps. Um, so, <laughs> In a way, when you're working with a team in a law firm, when you're exploring the client's journey, you know, the client's journey could actually look and feel a bit like this to them, you know, a bit look and feel a bit like you're going to have this procedure done, you know. So, you know, this is the way that it, it's kind of, it, 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 it's, it's a design process. It's a creative process. You're actually building your team's collaborative, creative skill set and of course their, their CX capabilities here as well. You're, you're facilitating them, you're helping them to actually reimagine the client journey. Maybe just one part of the client journey, maybe the overall client journey, but reimagine that client journey, perhaps not going that far, perhaps not reimagining the journey, perhaps just uplifting the journey, just eliminating some of those service dissatisfiers and identifying some of those plus points I'd even go so far as to say they're basically you know, service basics. Getting those service basics right, getting those in place and getting those right and delivering those consistently can be a law firm's biggest differentiator. So it would be a mistake to say client experience is about technology in the way that I think it's also a mistake to say innovation equals technology as well. All of those things are enablers of the client experience and they don't have to be breakthrough moments. They don't have to be breakthrough uh, new technologies, they can just be service basics that elevate the experience. It just so happens here, though, of course, that in thinking about the world from the child's point of view and how to make this experience better and get better results, the result was actually this. Um, and look, how amazing is that? So they transformed the environment. They turned it into an adventure. They welcomed the child to the hospital with a pirate's hat so that the nurses and the doctors became part of the story. They became part of the action. Um, and I love that because, you know, again, it goes back to the point that it's not just the environment. It's not just the procedure. 
um, it's actually all the actors, all the roles that, that, that help to bring that to life as well. Again, all of your roles and functions within your law firm, if that's where you're sitting, <laughs> um, we're, all, we're all performance. We all help to bring that to life, whether it's on stage or backstage. And I think that's very evident here. So, you know, the amazing results from, from, from making this, uh, this change, um, from, you know, lessening the child's fear factor and, and, and actually the medical results improved as well. So, you know, by lessening the anxiety and changing some of the process, you know, we're able to identify things quicker and actually because of that lessening of anxiety, um, the improvement in, in the medical results um, came about that much faster. So really incredible change. So, you know, again, inviting your team into this conversation in a really practical way, because they have a lot of answers about improvements already. You know, they're at the cold face. You know, sometimes we don't need to get client insight to know that actually doing this or that, changing this or that just makes sense. We'd actually, we don't need to talk to our clients about that. We just do that. And sometimes, you know, your teams already know those things that, that, that uh, need to be changed, but they just haven't been given a structured opportunity to actually work on that. And that's what you're offering them through this CX development. So the result of just focusing on, um, of just focusing on consideration and engagement for Moors was, was actually incredible. So, um, through reshopping, doing that mystery shop, we uh, and making those process changes in, in the middle between you know where we started and where we where we ended up. So process changes were made. The the initial touch points were kind of elevated and changed. Um, we understood that there were new skills that are required to have a better conversation with clients and so on. By making all of those changes, then good things happen. So you know, the same amount of money available to win across a series of inquiries. Uh, now, though, the likelihood of moving a potential client to being a client improved from two in 10 to seven in 10. The net promoter score went up a massive um, 75 points to plus 56. The firm would now had the, the opportunity to bank, you know, uh, an enormous amount more revenue as well just by focusing on CX and focusing their efforts on that part of the client's journey. And that was really all they needed to then <laughs> understand that, that, you know, CX is not just a light and fluffy smile when you dial one hit wonder type um, uh, intervention. Um, it is um, a, a focus with business impact um, that ought to be taken seriously that has a business case, has return on investment, and uh, can constructively involve um, and appropriately involve a number of roles and functions within the firm um, to get the job done. Yeah. Um, then, of course, it's about making things stick. <laughs> so I mentioned kind of process improvements that elevate the experience. Um, so kind of more process oriented changes, for instance, but let's not forget about skills and behaviors um, and, and you know, develop, learning, learning and development. So the other thing that Moores did um, with us was actually to make sure that, that, that those capabilities, those skills, how to have a better conversation with potential clients. What does that template look like? Where do we start? What kind of questions do we ask to understand how we can help? and unpack the value for the client? How do we have those conversations? How do we close the conversation so that we actually move a client from A to B and not simply say, good luck, call us when you're already a bad way to finish a productive conversation you may have had. So what you can see on screen here is a template for an initial conversation. So that was designed. There was conversation design that was a part of the journey design, the experience design. We were designing conversations and then documenting those conversations in a way that could kind of be slotted into a playbook that teams could refer to, could use as a, as a learning tool um, to make sure that the changes they've made now stuck um, and, you know, the firm could come back to um, the kind of changes that they, they knew they wanted to kind of maintain. 
So you know, this is a template for making, for, for having a good conversation. And, you know, I've just also alluded to um, the playbook. So almost you know, then taking those conversations and creating dialogue guides so that lawyers, you know, can actually be trained um, and be coached um, to have those better conversations so that receptionists, you know, will pick up the phone in a certain way, will transfer the, 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 the inquiry, knowing that it's about concierging the client, it's about hosting the client. And, you know, those, those, are, those are important terms because, you know, for Moores, it was about showcasing their value, it was about focusing on the experience. It was about understanding that um, to differentiate, it's about concierging the client. It's about care beyond the legal advice. And it's also then about knowing what, how does that look? How does that sound? Dialogue guides, yeah? Um, uh, for each role and function that interacts with, 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 with the client. Um, so that also needed to be captured. So once, once Moores had got to that point, um, um, you know, when I talk about Moores, I'm also in my head thinking about, you know, whether experience we've had in the field with, with a plethora of different law firms, um, all doing similar kind of work and take, taking a similar kind of journey. Um, uh, this particular firm decided, right, okay, now, now we can go broad. Now we can look at the entire client journey and we need to get insight that supports the improvement of the entire client journey and client experience. Um, and we can back ourselves now on our investment in client experience. So part of what they did, unsurprisingly, I guess, was to then um, have really great conversations with a number of clients about their service sentiment toward, toward the law firm. So we actually under, undertook 20 client interviews across all practice areas, and usually as well interviewing private clients, so family clients. It's probably more usual to know that we'd be interviewing commercial clients, but to actually have conversations with <clears throat> um, family law clients, often very sensitive, um, you know, very highly personal uh, matters, um, to talk to, them, talk to them about the experience they've had with the law firm, quite unusual and so revealing. So, you know, they undertook that kind of client listening exercise where um, it was about interviewing a number of clients. And to cut a long story short, <laughs> um, this diagram basically just presents some of the outcomes from all of those conversations. So there are actually over a hundred improvement points uh, from speaking to 20 clients that could be dealt with. Um, all of those had to be analyzed and all of them had to be prioritized. So we were able to kind of boil them, boil them down. And if you look at this graph, we've got kind of impact on the vertical axis and effort on the horizontal axis. And we've also got basic satisfier and delighter so um, there's a technique running behind this, um, but you know, it's about understanding you know, which ideas have, are gonna have maximum impact and are potentially not gonna take us too much effort to install, to develop and install. But also it's about understanding, okay, so we can, we can, we can in, continue to increase our lawyer's legal competence, but basically that's only ever gonna be a basic or satisfactory um, improvement there's only so far you can go with being brilliant at the law so what are some of the other ideas coming out of the client insight that actually are standout ideas you know they that clients have have given us a clue that if we work on that idea it's really going it's going to delight it's absolutely going to delight us um, you know it may be about how you actually you know present your advice it might be actually about how you close the matter and how you actually present a report of advice that's even more valuable for, for this client organization to take into their organization. It might be about how you actually design an aftercare approach following the close of a matter that keeps the client in the loop, keeps them updated, makes them a part of your community. All of those things could lead to client delight, but those things are informed very much by client insight. And then what we did at Moores and what we're, what we're doing now is working with teams within Moores to build on those ideas, to go through the design thinking process, 
to go through the innovation process and bring those ideas to life. The ideas they know, because they've spoken with clients, um, are going to make a dent in the universe for their clients. Um, so let's bring it all back, deep breath. So, you know, everything I've been through, and there's a lot to get your head around there potentially, um, is about building a truly client focused firm. It's about building a remarkable service culture. And there's a lot more I can say about the information on this slide, but simply enough, an A, B, or C, A, B, and C, right? An A, B, and C process. So we, we looked at the client journey. So there's a client's journey that um, needs to be improved. I mean, it will need to be improved. I don't care how good you think you are, that client journey, there's all sorts of opportunities to improve. Improve life for your clients, improve life for your staff. Right? But then there's a development journey as well. A, B, and C. First things first, activate. You know, understand the business case. Um, uh, understand what your data is already telling you. Um, get some new da data that, that, that provokes, that can be used as a catalyst for action for you guys internally. Activate your leaders, activate your staff. Make turning clients into promoters your firm's defining goal. That's about activation, right? Great, lively, focused conversations. Design, design the experience with some insight from clients and from operators and from staff. Set about designing the client's experience. That's a, that's a combination of plus ones and minus ones. Marginal gains, yeah? Many of those things are gonna be quick wins that require little or no investment and certainly don't require the latest and greatest technology. Um, some, other of, some other of those things are going to be, you know, they're, they're going to be breakthrough things. They're going to be changing a process, even changing a model. Um, but let's not get caught up in innovation. You know, some of these things are just basic changes that when we just stop and focus um, and identify those things, improve them and deliver them consistently can again be the, uh, an organization's greatest differentiator. And then C, making everything stick. So, you know, it's about um, making sure the learning and development is in place, the skills and capabilities are captured, um, that if you like, a playbook for your firm's client experience is created that helps you embed. And of course, it's also about continuing with insight and client feedback um, so you have a feedback loop um, that allows you to continually develop and use that information in an actionable way. So underpinning all of that then is, of course, the need to um, uh, have client insight tools, tools that help you to see the world from the client's point of view, to gain their perspective and combine that with your own to continue to elevate the client experience. I have to say that the magic really happens um, when you fully understand that each and every member of your team is a games maker in the client's experience. There are two shots here. One is of the 2012 London Olympics and the other one is of an Apple store. So the one on the left, um, I was in London in 2012 and I lived just around the corner from the London Olympics. And, you know, <laughs> the lady there with the um, high-vis jacket on they, they were described as games makers. They were members of the public who uh, were the crowd controllers, you know, the entertainers, the people with the big foam hands, right? That actually made the, they made the games as much as the athletes did. You know, they, 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 um, they brought the games to life. They entertained the crowds. They were there with a smile and they were there to do a job. Um, and and I, I just think that's just a, one, a wonderful phrase, really. And I know I've referred to it a bit now throughout this presentation. It's the way in which you need to think about every single team member in your team. Um, that, you know, the curtain is up, uh, whether we're backstage or on stage, we all play a part in, in, in delivering an amazing, remarkable client experience, games makers. I like the Apple one. I know it's easy to refer to Apple, but Apple, you know, has a phrase. It says, you know, Yes, we have amazing products and design and all the rest of it, but actually what we need to create is an all around mandate, an all around mandate for success. So like, it's the same understanding. 
that whether you are an Apple Store team member, whether you are a designer, um, you know, or work at the head office or whatever the case might be, is we're all focused on one thing really, and that is, you know, customer delight. <laughs> And we understand what that means in practice, and we all work toward delivering that. It's not just an aspiration. You know, and Apple stores, um, they are the most profitable um, stores per square foot than any other store in the world. They're more profitable than Tiffany's per square foot. And it's not just to do with the product, it's how that product is positioned and brought to life, how those service providers deal with their customers um, that um, turns their product into an amazingly profitable brand. And I have to say, I think it should be and can be exactly the same for legal service providers. So I told you it would be a whistle-stop tour with plenty of content to uh, digest. And I think I've probably proven that to be the case. Carl, I've got a, a quick one for you. And um, I was thinking this through your presentation, which was excellent, and thank you very much for it. Um, but I guess I've thought this um, often as well, and that is if you were a, a law firm, you know, wanting to take the, the journey that uh, Moores is clearly on and, and has decided to take, is there kind of, is there, I know this might sound a little bit strange, but is there a tipping point or are there kind of uh, red flags almost in a way that, can help you identify that this is really something that you can and want to do. Um, and I'm guessing here, you know, beyond um, kind of the obvious where you've got a really um, visionary managing partner, um, is it all up to them and, and finding that person or having that person for it to happen? Or could, could I, as an entrepreneur that's really excited about this, gather some things together and say, hey, this is a great journey for us to take. And um, here's why I think we should take it. Yeah, great, great questions. Um, in answer to the first question, um, you know, what, what, what might provoke an organization to, to, to kind of embrace this type of journey? You know, what, what's, what's the why? Um, you know, it's often the case that an organization will identify that, that um, it, it has clients that are potentially at risk, you know, high value clients that it knows there have been a couple of critical incidents, for instance, you know, in dealing with a matter or whatever the case, case might be, that, that puts that client at risk. So it, it puts the, the client retention piece in, in, in jeopardy essentially mm. so that's what that's often the starting point is you know we have a client or some clients that we feel we could have done better with or could be working better with they may be at risk or unsure um, this also could be the case for for other clients as well that we have so i think there's a sense of risk is what i'm saying you know the, the, the firm might have a sense of risk whatever that risk is that it wants to explore further. And so the way it might do that is obviously by, you know, engaging an external party to start having those conversations on its behalf with, with, with clients. That's often where it might start. Well, the opposite might be true, is we're doing some fantastic work and we want to double down on that now. We want to grow our client work. We want to grow that particular relationship with the client. We want to build on the things we're already doing well. So it might be an opportunity focus or it might be a risk focus, I would say. Um, and look, I think there's, it's funny because I think the firms we tend to end up working with are the firms that kind of go, we just know we can be a lot better at this. <laughs> you know, we just know that we drop the ball when it comes to, you know, how we bill or we've got, you know, debtors that are basically, you know, the, the information that's telling us we can be better at this. We can just improve. Um, and that's enough of a question for them to reach out. Mm -hmm to be curious about whether, whether the client experience could be an answer to that. So that's the first thing. And then if, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, um, what might you do? There's a lot you can do. And, and I would say that the work, our experience of doing the work is it's not, it doesn't always come from, you know, 
an inspirational CEO. It could be a practice leader who wants to take her practice to the next level. Um, it could come from an L&D director. It could come from the marketing person. So it doesn't just start with a CEO. Um, and, you know, again, I think for any of those people, it's about building the business case. So if understanding the why and um, what might be the compelling reason to invest. So again, it's about thinking about you know, how well are we doing with clients? What does the information already tell us about that if we have any? Um, and can we reach out and basically get a sense of how we're performing? Um, the other thing is that sometimes firms are um, not ready to speak to clients. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> It's like, now, nah, even though this is about client experience, we don't want to talk to any clients right now. <laughs> Which is always, and we learn to live with that. And, and, you know, I kind of understand it as well. So it's like, well, let's just do some work by ourselves then, shall we? You know, let's just club together and let's get around the table and actually start doing a bit of journey mapping, you know, together. And, and let's just see what we already think we may know. And that's just a lovely way to go about it as well. So it's, it's called assumptive journey mapping, where you kind of go, no worries. Let's just come together and start working on it. Let's just make this a conversation. We've got some tools. Let's get together. And then you build some confidence with what you're doing and the team builds some confidence. And you kind of go, oh, wow. They go, oh, wow. Wouldn't it be amazing if we spoke with clients? And you go, yeah, let's do it. You know, and then you kind of you use the information that you've been working on together. And you kind of go, And you use that as a provocation with clients. So unlike normal interviews where you kind of go, oh, yeah, so we should know your sector better, shouldn't we? You know, and all of those traditional things you speak to clients about. And actually, go, we've put some thinking in already. We, we've got some areas here that we think, you know, we might do better on or this or that. And then the client kind of goes, wow, you've really thought about this, haven't you? Mm. Oh, because you thought about it, let, let's, let, let's collaborate. And so actually, that's a good way around of doing it as well. Yeah. Long like, answer is just... It was great, great responses. And, and I've got one other quick question for you. And I, and I know that you and I have discussed this, um, you know, often, but for the folks that are still kind of speaking about client satisfaction versus client experience, because, you know, it's not semantics and it's not just um, jargon. It really does signal quite a significant difference and I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes just to explain that difference between client satisfaction and client experience or underscore yeah. it, perhaps more to the point um, yeah because it's worth underscoring I think yeah um, it's a good one um, I've just gone back a couple of slides because you know if we look at service on a scale and you know from service criminal at zero to, you know, service delight at 10. Satisfaction is actually seven and eight on that scale, satisfaction. So if I'm satisfied, I'm likely to score you at seven and an eight. <clears throat> um, but satisfaction doesn't lead to, wow, I got this legal result, good. Um, but I had this experience, I had an experience that left me feeling like, this law firm would do anything for me. And that's how I feel about my, my law firm. So that's an experience that led to a nine and 10 um, and would lead to advocacy, mm. tension. So by focusing on client satisfaction, you're, you're focusing on, on average <laughs> in a yeah. way. You're focusing on parity really you're not focusing on wow you know you're not focusing on delight you're not focusing on getting to a 10 um so look there's a lot to be said for for satisfying clients you know and getting those basics delivered consistently well so let's not mock that but it is different to going for a 10 which in the end is a much more motivational goal and aspirational goal also to engage your team in as well um, and we know, we know the difference as customers. We know what a seven or eight feels like, and we know what a nine and 10 feels like. We know what good service is. We know what amazing service is. Which would you prefer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for, you know, um, another amazing presentation. Again, really thought-provoking. Um, we're all moving to Moors now, so um, thank you for uh, <laughs> identifying them for us. Um, but a, a great case study and really congrats for them because um, it's, it's an amazing story to be able to tell and for you folks, obviously, who have supported them along the way. Um, Folks, obviously, as members of the Legalpreneurs Lab, you know that Carl is our, uh, our guru in this area of client experience and that you have the opportunity to reach out to him for uh, a 15-minute free consultation if, as you kind of take all of this on board and think about it, have questions for him later. He is available um, for that for you. So you'll find... Uh, a quick link to his contact details, obviously, on the centre's uh, website, but you'll also find him on LinkedIn or you can jot these down now. He or Julian, I'm sure, will be happy to direct um, inquiries to him. And um, I know that you'll enjoy those conversations. Um, I certainly, certainly do and have enjoyed many of them, as Carla's also um, one of the centre's distinguished fellows. So thank you all very much um, for attending. Don't forget to uh, check into that LinkedIn site that we've got for the lab so that you've got the, um, the opportunity to uh, keep up to date with um, all of these uh, Geeky Guru and Residence series and other things that are coming along as well. And again, Carl, um, really, really appreciate your time. Love having you as one of our geeky gurus. Um, thank you very much again um, for your time today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye.